So inventories and cost of sales. Merchandise inventory includes all goods that a company owns and holds for sale. This is true regardless of whether the goods are located um, when inventory is counted. Certain inventory items require special attention, including goods in transit, goods on consignment, and goods that are damaged or obsolete. So I don't know, sometimes you guys will go in, will go into a retail store and we'll see, you know, that there's tags everywhere and maybe you'll even see someone and they have a, a, a gun, a little computer and they're scanning things. That's what they're doing. They're taking inventory, okay? And they're doing that because again, like we say, there's this thing in, in retail we talked about called shrinkage where things either the company was supposed to get it and they never receive it or things are uh, taken either by the employees either to use internally in the store an example might be maybe uh, somebody's cleaning the store and they just grab a bottle of cleaner off or a, there's a spill and they just grab a roll of paper towels out of off the shelf um, they don't account for that, that shrinkage, or we know that things walk out the door. Uh, what I call the five finger discount. I don't know if you guys have heard that term or not. Um, so that's why, for example, I know, um, one of the reasons why I don't shop there, but whatever, but at Walmart, why everything now is locked up and it's crazy stuff that's locked up. Or uh, I was thinking for an example, uh, with the razors that you know us guys that we use i was using the, the gillette razors with the little cartridges well sometimes those are locked up or different things and so now i know i use the uh, dollar shave club now where they send them to me because again those were hard to find because people that's something small that people steal and they cost a lot of money so that's why one of the reasons we do this the other thing too is sometimes product gets damaged when it's put out on the sales floor so for example uh maybe at the grocery store they'll have maybe a box of uh maybe they're putting out all the cereals and maybe when they slice the the carton open it they slice open the actual box so they can't sell that now or they can't sell it at the full price. So we do inventory. The other things mentioned there is to say there, there are goods that are in transit. Maybe a company purchases merchandise, but it hasn't been received yet by that company. The supplier sent it, but they haven't received it. Consignment is like when you have something and you sell it maybe at another store. Or for example, um, you have what they call like a consignment store where like they're selling merchandise from many different people. So it's like that. And then also what damage I talked about or things can get crushed while they're on the retail floor. Or we know too that things become obsolete either because things expire. So like food is one of the things that expires or things become obsolete. So for example, a lot of your electronics, that's something that becomes obsolete or there's a new model. So we have to account for all of that. So goods in transit. So does a purchaser's inventory include goods in transit from the supplier? The answer is that if ownership has passed to the purchaser, the goods are included in the purchaser's inventory. So we determine this by reviewing the shipping terms. And I know we discussed this last week, FOB destination or FOB shipping point. Goods purchased FOB shipping point are included in the buyer's inventory once the items are shipped. Goods purchased FOB destination are included in the buyer's inventory after they arrive at their destination. So if it's FOB shipping point, once it has left the custody of the seller, it now is the purchaser's property. Now, if it's FOB destination, then it becomes once the purchaser receives it okay we talked about that before now goods on consignment are goods shipped by the owner who is the consigner to another party the consignee the consignee sells goods for the owner the consigner continues to own the consigned goods and reports them in its inventory the consignee never reports consigned goods in inventory 
an example of this might possibly be, I'm sure that you're all familiar with Amazon. And so Amazon has a program called Amazon FBA, which is where people send merchandise in to Amazon and then Amazon then sells it. So that would be the consigner is whoever is sending in the products and then the consignee then is Amazon. So there's some things there with that where the consigner, it's still their goods, even though it's not in their, on their premises, it, it's, it's an Amazon's warehouse. And the consignee then wouldn't be necessarily as concerned about that. Now, obviously, then there's some things that come into play then if, let's say, uh, the products aren't selling, then Amazon actually charges the person that sent those things in, the company that sent those things in, either to destroy them or to send them, obviously, back. Okay? But that might be an example of uh, consignment. And in goods that are damaged or obsolete, damaged and obsolete, and deteriorated goods are not reported to inventory if they cannot be sold. Um, if these goods can be sold at a reduced price, they're included in the inventory at the net realizable value, which is the sales price minus uh, the selling price. Net realizable, so I said that, the period where damaged or obsolete or deterioration occurs is the period when the loss in value is reported. And so we know things happen all the time. Things deteriorate, things get broken while they're uh, on the store shelf. Okay, we're familiar with that. So, determining inventory costs. Merchandise inventory includes costs to bring an item to a sellable condition and location. This means the cost of an inventory item includes its invoice cost minus any discount and plus other costs, including shipping, storage, import duties, and insurance. Um, so it could also be maybe you're in a business where you're selling, maybe, I don't know, maybe you're selling uh, computers. Maybe you buy computers and you fix them up and you resell them. What would be the cost of the computer plus the cost to f upgrade it and fix it so that it could be resold? That might include that, okay? Um, but again, the shipping cost, we've talked about that earlier. Uh, storage, so for example, if you have to pay to rent another location to store your merchandise, like in a warehouse, or maybe it's something that is perishable, so you have to keep it like in a, in a frozen uh, cold storage, that would be a part of that. Um, insurance, and then of course, import duties. When you import products, let's say from another country, so from China, into this country, you have to pay import duties, depending upon the product and, and, and that. And so that would be included as well. Okay. So internal controls and taking a physical count. We've already hinted at this already. Events can cause the inventory account balance to be different than the actual inventory available. Again, such events, as I say, are theft, loss, damage, and errors. Thus, nearly all companies take a physical count of inventory at least once a year. And they'll usually do it at least once a year around tax time whenever the company is going to do their taxes, usually. Um, this physical count is used to adjust the inventory account balance to the actual inventory that is available. A company has adequate internal controls over the inventory count if it uses pre-numbered inventory tags, inventory counters are, have no responsibility for inventory, and the count confirms the existence, amount, and condition of inventory, and a second count of inventory is made, and the count supervisor confirms that all items in the inventory have been counted. So usually what companies will do sometimes is they won't necessarily do the inventory themselves, they'll hire a third party. And so that's sometimes what you'll see at like Walmart or you'll see that like at Lowe's or whatever, that they've hired a third party to come in and do this because they don't have any uh, conflict there in either, in either way. 
And so they'll have pre-numbered inventory tickets or they do it, you know, on like a, a tablet or some kind of a device. And then again, the counters go through, they count everything up. And then a second count is made by somebody else. And then the manager then confirms that all the items were counted only once. Inventory costing methods. So there are four methods are used to assign costs to inventory and the cost of goods sold. So it could be specific identification, first in, first out, or FIFO, last in, first out, LIFO, and weighted average. The exhibit shows the frequency and use of these. And so we see that first in, first out, that that is the most frequently used. So inventory cost flow assumptions. We must make assumptions about the inventory cost flow. First in, first out assumes cost flow in the order incurred. Last in, first out assumes cost flow is the reverse order occurred. Weighted average assumes cost flow on the average of the costs available. So again, this depends upon when the items were purchased and then when they're being sold and then that uh, would affect it. So a company's merchandise available for sale consists of what the beginning inventory is, so what they had before, what they purchase, so the new purchases. The merchandise available is either sold, which is the cost of goods sold, or it could be kept for future sales, which would be the ending inventory. So you might sometimes purchase things and you're gonna sell them right away. You might purchase inventory and you might have to sit on it for a little while. Okay. So now we're gonna talk specifically about uh, these different methods. Inventory costing under the perpetual system. So again, remember most businesses, which actually for the homework, I think I only had uh, questions on the uh, perpetual system because that's what most companies what they use okay so when I, when identical items are purchased at different costs we must determine which amounts to record in the cost of goods sold and which amounts remain in inventory cost flow assumptions do not have to follow the physical the actual physical flow Okay, so we're going to look here at an example. So here is information about the mountain bike inventory for trekking uh, for the month of August. So trekking is a sporting goods store. Among its many products, trekking carries one type of mountain bike whose sales are directed at resorts that provide inexpensive bikes for guest use. We use trekking's data from August. If mountain bike units inventory at the beginning of August and its purchases during the month of August are shown on this slide, it ends August with 12 bikes remaining in inventory. So so we see here that the beginning inventory, they had 10 units that cost $91 a piece at the beginning on the first. And then on the third, they purchased 15 more bikes, but this time they cost 160, excuse me, $106 a piece. And then on the 14th, we sold 20 bikes and we sold them at a, we sold them for $130, meaning that we received $130 for uh, the bikes. That left then that we had, we started out then with, we had 25 bikes. Now we have five bikes left. So then we had to buy, we bought 10 more bikes for resale that cost us 115. So then that meant that on the 17th, that meant that we had 25 bikes in inventory. And then on the 28th, we bought 10 more bikes at $119 a piece. So we had 35 bikes now in inventory. And then on the August the 30th, we sold 23 more bikes, but this time we charged $150 to our customer that left us with 12 bikes, okay? 
So the total number of bikes that they had that were available for sale was 55 uh, bikes. And then they had, which cost us $5,990. That's what they cost the company. All right, so specific identification using the perpetual system. So when each item inventory can be matched with the specific purchase and invoice, we use the specific identification or SI, which is also called specific invoice inventory pricing to assign cost. So we also need sales records that identify exactly which items were sold and when. So for example, each bike's serial number could be used to track costs and compute costs of goods sold. Trek's internal documents reveal the following specific sales. So they had on August the 14th, they sold eight bikes costing $91 each and 12 bikes that cost 105 each. And then on August the 30th, they sold two bikes that cost 91 each, three bikes that cost 105 each, and 15 bikes that cost 115, and uh, three bikes that cost 119. Now, this would require that, that the company would have to keep track again of each of the, so when they come in, the serial number, and then how much it costs the company for it, and then they'd have to track then with that serial number specifically, how much they received for it, how much they uh, charged a customer for it. And so we can see that here, how they, how they did that. So when using specific identification, Trek's cost of goods sold reported on the income statement totals 4,582. So that's the sum of 2,000 and 2,582 from this third column above. Trek's ending inventory reported on the balance sheet is $1,408, which is the final inventory balance on the fourth column, because that's how much they had. So they sold in the amount of 4,582, and then they had $1,408 in, in bikes available for sale. So first in, first out. So you use the oldest cost, uh, and then you use the recent cost for the inventory. So first in, first out method of assigning costs assumes the inventory items are sold in the order acquired. When sales occur, the costs of the earlier units acquired are charged to the cost of goods sold. This leaves the costs from the most recent purchases in the in, in the ending inventory. So this one, we're thinking then that we're going to use, sell basically the oldest ones first. Okay. And so we see here an example of how we would use FIFO. So use the FIFO by for uh, computing the cost of inventory and cost of goods sold is shown here. Uh, this exhibit shows the beginning inventory of 10 bikes for $91 each. And so again, and you see here when they purchased and when they, so purchased and then when they sold and where we were at. So Trex FIFO cost of goods sold reported on its income statement, which reflected the 45, excuse me, 43 units that were sold is $4,000. $570. So that's 1970 plus 2600 And this ending inventory reported on the balance sheet reflects the 12 units unsold at 1420 So both of these are when they sold. And again, they're going to do sell the oldest one first. And then they're assuming then that the cost here, these are what they have that they're going to have the cost then what they're going to have left in inventory would be the latest ones that they've purchased okay so last in first out the last in first out method is abbreviated as lifo uh, when using lifo we assign the most recent costs to the unit sold this leaves the older costs to be used for the ending inventory
Okay, so we see here that the last in, last uh, first out method of assigning costs assumes that the most recent purchases are sold first. So that means the newest ones that come in, those are the ones that we get rid of first. The other one is the oldest in inventory is what we're getting rid of uh, first for FIFO. So this one's the newest, most recent inventory received is what's going right out. Uh, these more recent costs are charged at the cost of goods sold and the cost of the earliest purchases are assigned to inventory. By assigning costs from the most recent purchases to cost of goods sold, LIFO comes closest to matching current costs of goods sold with revenues compared to FIFO or weighted average. And so again, you see here example of how they did it. So TREX, LIFO costs of goods sold reported on the balance excuse me, on the income statement is 4,730. So that's 2,045 plus 2,685. And it's ending inventory reported on the balance sheet is 1,260. Okay, weighted average. The weighted average, also called average cost method of assigning cost, requires that we use the weighted average cost per unit of inventory at the time of each sale. Weighted average cost per unit at the time of each sale equals the cost of goods available for sale divided by the units available. Okay, and so we see an example here. So on August the 1st and 3rd, the company purchased inventory. On August the 14th, it sold 20 bikes. What is the total cost of inventory assigned, would be the total cost assigned to the bikes that were sold on August the 14th? So first, we need to compute the weighted average cost per unit of the items in inventory. We do this by dividing the cost of goods available for sale of 2,500 by the total units in inventory, which is 25. So that me meant that the average cost per unit is 100. So the cost of goods sold for August the 14th is 2,000 or 20 bikes at $100 each. So after this sale, there are five units left in inventory at an average cost of $100 each for a total inventory balance of 500. Okay. okay, so next, a purchase is made on August the 17th. What is the average weighted cost per unit of items in inventory on August the 17th? Well, there are five units in, in, in ending inventory plus the 20 units purchased on August the 17th. Total cost of the goods available for sale is 2,800 divided by the 25 units. So that equals 112 weighted average cost per unit. So we see here again, when we purchase after that, we have five bikes at $100 a piece. And then we purchased more bikes, five at 100 and then 20 at 115. So we take, we add and then add up and divide. So we get that each bike then that we have now in inventory is 112. Okay. So now after the August the 28th purchased, there are 35 units in inventory. So five plus 20 plus 10. So 35 units in inventory totaling 2,800 plus 1,190. So that equals 3,990. So then 3,990 divided by 35 is $14 a, a, uh, a unit. So so we see that the cost of goods sold for 
August the 31st sale is, or August 30th it should be, is 2,622. So after the August 30th sale, there are 12 units of inventory at 1,368 or 12 units at an average cost of $114. And this is just breaking it down. So you see here the total that was purchased and then again how much each bike was and then again the average then for each time that they were purchased and then again the inventory and then how much was sold. So financial statement effects of the costing methods. So all four inventory costing methods are acceptable. However, a company must disclose the inventory method it uses in its financial statements or notes. And so it's important a company would choose what uh, method they are going to use and then it's best, they need to stick to it. At least they have to stick to it through at least that uh, fiscal period. So particularly for taxes, so throughout like that year. And then after that, then if they want to switch, they can't. But it's important that they stick to it and then that they need to disclose that. Um, so FIFO inventory on the balance sheet approximates its current costs. It also follows the actual flow of goods for most businesses. So usually we're gonna sell so usually we're gonna sell the oldest inventory first, usually. So if you think about the grocery store and like the milk, if they get more milk they're going to put the new milk in the back, push the old to the front because we want to sell the, that that's coming up sooner. We want to sell that first, if you kind of think of it that way. So most businesses, they work on FIFO where they're selling the oldest inventory first. So LIFO is the cost of goods sold on the income statement, approximates its current cost. It also better matches uh, the current cost when re with revenues in computing gross profit. And then the weighted average uh, smooths out erratic changes in cost because you're going, you average everything out. And then specific identification matches the cost of items with the revenues that they generate. Financial statement affects inventory costing for the perpetual method. So each method offers certain advantages as follows. So for example, in times of rising costs, FIFO reports the lowest cost of goods sold yielding the highest gross profit and net income. LIFO reports the highest cost of goods sold yielding the lowest gross profit and net income. And the weighted average yields results between both FIFO and LIFO. And so then in times of falling costs, uh, FIFO reports the highest cost of goods sold yielding the lowest gross profit and income. And then FIFO reports the lowest cost of goods sold yielding the highest gross profit and income. So now companies can and often do use different costing methods for financial reporting and tax reporting. The only exception is when LIFO is used for tax reporting. In this case, the IRS requires that it also be used in financial statements called the LIFO conformity rule. So the IRS requires that when a company is using FIFO for the taxes reporting, that they also have to be using it for their financial statements. So the lowest, okay, so lower of cost or market. So inventory must be reported at market value when market is lower than cost. So after companies apply one of four costing methods, either FIFO, LIFO, weighted average, or the specific identification, inventory is reviewed to ensure it is reported at the lower of cost or market, LCM. LCM requires the inventory be reported at 
the market value or cost of replacing inventory when market value is lower than cost. So market is in the term LCM is defined as replacement cost for LIFO, but net realizable value for the other three methods. Advanced courses cover the specifics. A decline in market value means a loss of value in inventory. When market value is lower than cost, a loss is recorded. When market value is higher than cost, no adjustment is made. LCM is applied in one of three ways, either one, either to each individual item separately, to major categories for each item, or the entire inventory. When LCM is applied to individual items in inventory, the number of comparisons equals the number of items. For Roadster, 140,000 is the lower of the 170,000 cost and the 140,000 market. For Sprint, 50,000 is the lower of the 50,000 cost and a 60,000 market. This yields a $190,000 reported inventory computed from 140,000 for Roadster plus 50,000 for Sprint. So the journal, and then we see the journal entry. The journal entry to record the adjustment downward of inventory to lower of cost or market indicates a debit to the cost of goods sold and a credit to merchandise inventory for 30,000. So what it is you have to take either, so you notice here that for example, Roadster, the market value that it might've cost a company 170, but the market value for that is 140. So that's what they're gonna have to apply then and change their inventory to. Uh, for Sprint, it costs them 50, market value is 60, so they can go ahead and continue to use what it costs them. And so to adjust then the difference for Roadster of 30,000 to record their inventory and make it agree to what it's worth now, they do the cost of goods sold 30 and then the merchandise inventory for 30,000. You will be working with that um, on the uh, homework. So now, uh, income statement effects of inventory errors. So this slide shows the effect of inventory errors on key amounts in the current and net period income statements. So row one, year one. So right here. So we see understated ending inventory overstates the cost of goods sold. This is because we subtract a smaller ending inventory in computing cost of goods sold. A higher cost of goods sold yields a lower income. So our income is less than what it should have been. And then uh, row one, year two, we see that the understated ending balance of year one because of an understated beginning inventory for year two. So because it carries over. So it, it, it messes up year two because we show that we have less inventory than what we should. If the beginning inventory is understated, cost of goods sold is understated because we started with a smaller amount a lower cost of goods sold yields a higher income. And in uh, row two, year one, overstating ending inventory understates cost of goods sold. A lower cost of goods sold yields a higher income. And in row two, year two, right here, we see that Overstated ending inventory for year one becomes an overstated beginning inventory in year two. If beginning inventory is overstated, cost of goods sold is overstated. A higher cost of goods sold yields a lower income. Understating ending inventory understates both current and total assets. An understatement in ending inventory also yields an understatement in equity because of the understatement in net income. This slide shows 
the effects of inventory errors on the current period's balance sheet amounts. Okay, so another thing we have to think about is how long we're holding on to inventory, and that is the inventory turnover, also called merchandise inventory turnover, or simply turns, is one ratio that's used to assess whether management is doing a good job in controlling the amount of inventory. A low ratio means the company may have more inventory than it needs. Similarly, a very high ratio means inventory might be too low. This can cause lost sales if customers must back order merchandise. Inventory turnover has no simple rule except to say a high ratio is preferable provided inventory is adequate to meet demand. Because obviously if you go somewhere, let's say you go to a store, you're looking for a certain product and the product you want isn't available, they're sold out, you're gonna end up going elsewhere. So they're losing that. But at the same time, it does a company no good to have a huge inventory of something and for it to just sit there. So the day's sales and inventory is a ratio that reveals how much inventory is available in terms of the number of days sales. It can be interpreted as the number of days one can sell from inventory if no new items are purchased. This ratio is often viewed as a measure of the buffer against out of stock inventory and is useful in evaluating how quickly inventory is being sold. It is calculated as, in as ending inventory divided by the cost of goods sold multiplied by 365. So the day's sale of inventory focuses on ending inventory, whereas inventory turnover uh, focuses on average inventory. Because again, then that's figuring out then how much inventory, how long the inventory is gonna last and make sure you have enough. Analysis of inventory management. So we see here that merchandisers plan and control inventory purchases and sales. So this is an example of Costco and Walmart's inventory turnover and sales and inventory are shown below. So Costco's current year inventory turnover is 11.9 times, meaning it turns over its inventory 11.9 times per year. Costco's inventory turnover exceeds Walmart's turnover in each of the last three years. This is a positive for Costco as we prefer inventory turnover to be high, provided inventory is not out of stock and the company is not losing customers. The current year days sales and in inventory of 32.1 days means that Costco is carrying 32.1 days of sales and in inventory. This inventory buffer seems sufficient. As long as Costco is not at risk of running out of stock, it prefers its assets not to be tied up in inventory. So for example, you see that Costco, their inventory turnover is at 11.9 times. So that means that they're basically turning over their inventory every month, their, their, their whole inventory basically turns over. Um, we see here like for Walmart that it's 8.3. So we see that Walmart's not turning over their inventory quite as quickly. And then we see here the days in inventory so that they have 32.1 versus Walmart at 43.5. So Walmart has a lot more of a buffer if they weren't to receive items of inventory that they have versus what, what Costco has, but what Costco has definitely is is sufficient that they have more than a month of, of inventory available to them. Which this is important uh, concept if you're thinking about like in business, especially right now with some of the things that are going on in the world. I don't know if you've noticed, but certain things have come up missing in stores or been hard to, uh, to get. Uh, so for example, like with the toilet paper thing that happened at the beginning of the corona, um, that's partially why is obviously companies don't want to keep a lot of inventory on hand and it, obviously it costs money to do that. And then something happened that disrupted that. Uh, people went nuts, started overbuying, and then also 
some of the factories shut down or had some issues or they had to shift the type of production that they had. I know also um, I was seeing a thing today, uh, this morning, about somebody that they had to buy a new dishwasher and they had a hard time getting one. Um, appliances right now are hard to, to come by right now. And so if you have adequate inventory, you have them. So then when somebody needs, you know, wants to make a sale from you, you can. Um, otherwise, it causes a problem, you know, in that. Like, for example, I, I bought a washing machine in July. I didn't receive it until the beginning of this month, until a couple weeks ago, because Lowe's just simply, they couldn't, couldn't get them. So if they had a buffer of inventory, then they would have had it, but obviously it costs money to hold on to inventory and also to have, again, the space that that would take up versus the other things that they also sell that they need to keep an inventory on in their warehouse. They, you know, it makes it hard, you know, for them to do that. Um, but it's something that as a company, you have to figure out exactly what's happening and then you have issues with that. Or another thing to think about too, is if you think about something kind of close to home that thankfully I put in my order last night and we're getting some of the stuff is with our Avon customers. We've had several people that have bought certain products and it's been like a month and then we still haven't been able to get them. And so thankfully I put an order in last night and we're supposed to be getting those items this week. Uh, somebody had like an eyeshadow compact that we couldn't get for like a month, two months, because either I think we were waiting on the packaging to come from China or wherever. Again, because of the corona, obviously that's an issue. So you have to plan inventory and then how are you going to make sure that you have enough in order to meet the needs that are anticipated? There's quite a, a science and an art to that. So this is an appendix, but this is talking about the perpetual system, which is a little bit different, or excuse me, the periodic system, I'm sorry, which a lot of businesses don't use, but there are still some that, that do. Um, so when identical items, so this is inventory costing under the periodic system. So this is when you're not keeping inventory in real time, whereas, whereas with a perpetual system you are. Uh, so when identical items are purchased at different costs, you must we must determine which amounts to record in cost of goods sold and which amounts remain in inventory. Cost flow assumption does not have to follow the actual product flow like we said. And so again, if we look at this, which is similar to what we looked at before, uh, we We'll use this data throughout our inventory examples so we can compare our results at the end. The basic aim of the periodic system and the perpetual system is the same, and that is to assign costs to inventory and costs of goods sold. The same four methods are used to assign costs under both systems, either the specific identification, first in, first out, last in, first out, or the weighted average. The results would be the same, for the periodic and the perpetual system when using either specific identification or FIFO. So for FIFO and then for specific identification, it's gonna be the same no matter if you use the perpetual system or if you use the periodic system. It's gonna be a bit different for the others and we'll see. So this is an example for specific identification. So first, let's look at the specific identification method. In this method, we know the specific cost of each unit that is sold. And again, this is most commonly used in businesses that have a low sales volume of high dollar items. Example would be a car dealership because you can track that down to the VIN number of the car, exclusive jewelry stores, or custom builders because uh, So we look here at the at the bike shop. So again, they had an ending inventory they had and then they purchased things along the way and and that. So now using the specific identification method, the company would report cost of goods sold on its August income statement of four thousand five hundred and eighty two dollars. And it would report ending inventory of 1,408 on its balance sheet, which is the difference between the total units available 
and the cost of goods sold. And then we see here for uh, FIFO. The first in, first out method is abbreviated as FIFO. Uh, FIFO assumes that the inventory is sold in the order that it's acquired. We assign the older, earlier costs to the units sold. This leaves the most recent costs to be used to value ending inventory. And so we see here that it, during August, the trekking had a total of 55 units that were available for sale. They had 12 units left of an end inventory and they sold 43 units. Under FIFO, the cost of the 12 bikes in the end inventory would be valued using that most recent purchase that was made since the earlier units are assumed to have been sold under FIFO. And then again, the last in first out method is abbreviated as LIFO. LIFO assumes that the most recent purchases are sold first. This leaves the earlier costs that would be used then to uh, value ending inventory. So again, so during August, we see that Trekking had a total of 55 units available for sale. They had 12 bikes left in the ending inventory. They sold 43 units. So under LIFO, the cost of the 12 bikes and ending inventory would be valued using the earlier purchases uh, beginning with the beginning inventory. The units that were sold are assumed to be the most recently purchased units. And then finally for average cost, when using average weighted average, we assign an average cost per unit of the goods available for sale to cost of goods sold. The average cost per unit is determined by dividing the cost of goods available for sale by the units on hand. And so we see here, there are three steps in computing the cost of goods sold under weighted average method. Step one is to determine the total units and the total cost of goods sold. Trekking had 55 units available for sale at a cost of $5,990. Step two is to compute the weighted average cost per unit of the items in inventory. We do this by dividing the total cost of goods sold excuse me, total cost of goods available for sale of 5,990 by the total units available for sale, which is 55. The average cost per unit is $108.91. So in step three, we use the weighted average cost per unit to assign the cost at the ending inventory and to what was sold. Because we know then each bike cost $108.91. So you can multiply that by how many were sold and then how many were left over. And then we see here an example then of how it would compare for each one. And so because prices change, inventory methods nearly always assign different cost amounts. And then we see how that affects the uh, ending inventory and then also our net income. So this exhibit reveals two important results. First, when purchases costs regularly rise, as in the example of trekking that we saw, the following occurs. LIFO reports the lowest cost of goods sold, yielding the highest gross profit and net income. So that's for FIFO. So FIFO reports the lowest cost of goods sold and yielding that yields the highest gross profit because we're taking the oldest inventory, selling that, and we're assuming that then the price then for the oldest inventory, which is less. Now LIFO reports the highest cost of goods sold yielding in lower gross profit and the lower net income because again LIFO takes the newest that comes in first, sells that first, so the newest that's coming in would have a higher price in the example that we have because the prices are rising. Now weighted average yield result, results between FIFO and LIFO which helps to smooth out the erratic changes in cost. 
and then specific identification matches the cost of items with the revenues that they generate. So you know specifically because you can tell either by the serial number or whatever you can tell specifically if it's, if it's specific identification. Now second, when costs regularly decline, the reverse occurs for FIFO and LIFO. Namely, FIFO would give a higher uh, cost of goods sold, which would yield a lower gross profit and income, and that's if the prices are declining. However, F LIFO then gives the lowest cost of goods sold, yielding the highest gross profit and income. So inventory estimation methods. So inventory sometimes is estimated for two reasons. First, companies often report what are called interim financial statements, which are financial statements that are prepared in periods of less than one year. So usually either every quarter or every, every uh, six months. Okay. But they only take physical count of inventory annually. Second, companies may require an inventory estimate in some uh, casualty, for example, a fire or a flood that would make taking physical inventory impossible. So again, the example, I don't know if you guys remember, but the Atwater uh, Target, uh, there was a guy and I think he was shoplifting or something. I'm not really sure. We probably should look that up, huh? But he set the toilet paper and paper towel aisle on fire. And so you can imagine what kind of a mess that created because the store had to be evacuated. The fire department had to come in, had to use a lot of water, obviously, to put out the fire, a lot of smoke damage. So for them to go in and physically take inventory, I can't imagine that Target did that. They might have had a very good idea based on what the pause system said was in that store, but there might have very well been things either that were in that store that weren't recorded or which that, as you know, sometimes happens. You'll buy something, you'll go up to the register and it won't scan and then they, they'll ask you how much it was or they'll have to send somebody to go back. So that wasn't in their cash register. They didn't know it was in the store. So sometimes that'll happen or they also don't know if things left the store or left inventory that for some reason didn't go through the uh, cash register. So they had to make their best. They probably just used whatever was in their cash register to figure that out because obviously all the food and stuff, a lot of it probably had to be thrown away because of, of what happened and then of course uh, they had to clean up all of that. So it makes the physical inventory impossible, so we have to estimate, or we do it because of the different uh, types of things that happen. So estimates are usually only required for companies that use the periodic system. Companies that using a perpetual system would presume that they have updated inventory, as I say, like for example, with Target, they would have updated inventory, but even then it might possibly not match. Um, and so we see here for one reason or another, but it'd be pretty darn close. So this slide summarizes two methods uh, for estimate inventory, either the retail inventory method and the gross profit method. And so we see here for the retail inventory method, you have the uh, goods available for sale at retail minus the net sales. That equals the ending inventory at retail which then becomes your ending inventory at retail. And then you have the cost of uh, goods available for sale at cost divided by the goods available for sale at retail equals the cost of retail sale ratio. So you multiply the two and you get your ending inventory at cost what it should be. Or you can use the gross profit and there's a way that you can do that. 